Good morning, everyone. We are just in the process of letting everybody into the Zoom, so we'll start in about a minute. So let's get going on this beautiful Saturday morning. Good morning to everyone. And welcome to our local legislators issue forum, hosted by our elected officials, Senator Joanne Janal, Representative Kathy Kemp, Representative Andrew Basenecker, and Representative Judy Amabile. Today, our discussion is gonna focus on the upcoming reproductive rights ballot initiative to amend the Colorado constitution. Um, our speaker will be joining us shortly. So let me just give you a little information about how we're gonna manage the Zoom today. Um, after our presentation, we will have a question and answer session, and you'll be able to ask your questions in one of two ways. You may either click on the chat button on the bottom of the screen and uh, type your question in, or if you prefer to ask your question live, then toggle oval over and hit the raised hand function uh, I will see your virtual hand. Uh, my partner, Drake, will unmute you. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. And then after that, we'll put you back on mute to minimize any kind of background noise. Um, please note that today we're going to keep the chat open for everyone. So all of us will be able to see uh, what is typed in to the chat for today's conversation. Also, one request, uh, as we always want, uh, we ask you to uh, ask your questions and offer your comments in a respectful tone so we can set a very positive and pr productive uh, uh, tone for our conversation this morning. As we wait for our speaker, we are very lucky to have on the call today, uh, Rosemary Rader. Who, has, who is very well informed about this initiative and has offered to give us some background. So Rosemary, many, many thanks to you. And we'll take you off mute to give us some information about the ballot initiative. Great, thank you. Can, can you hear me? I am unmuted, yeah. I think. Um, first of all, I can know where um, as close to the people from Cobalt or Planned Parenthood who have been speaking on this issue, but I am a petition circulator. And I can tell you that um, as a member of the Northern Colorado Now group, we are very excited that this is going to be getting uh, put on the ballot. Um, some of the main talking points about this issue are, of course, we know in Colorado right now, we have fairly good, some of the best actually, um, abortion protection in the nation, but it is not part of our constitution. So it could be easily overturned if we had a change in the party in control of the government or a different governor and so on. So the idea is to really get this enshrined in the state constitution um, by amending the constitution uh, with actually just two very simple sentences, which I can read to you. Um, they are, the right to abortion is hereby recognized. Government shall not deny, impede, or discriminate against the exercise of that right, including health insurance coverage for abortion. So that will hopefully get on the ballot and be approved by voters. We know that we need that 55%. So anything you can do to help get people to sign to get this on the ballot will be great. Um, Part of the idea here is access to abortion. We know that due to that insurance issue, people that have state funded insurance are not eligible to have abortion coverage. So that's one reason for making sure this also gets into the constitution. So teachers and firefighters, for example, would be able to have that coverage. Um, Trying to see what uh, those were the two big points about the initiative that we really want this to be more permanent via the constitutional amendment and also again not discriminating uh, particularly on that abortion coverage. So I don't know if there's anything more I can say about that that you might want to well, ask, but 
Rosemary, we're going to ask you to stand by uh, to answer questions for everyone. First of all, thank you so much for offering that information. Senator Janal, I see that you have the re actual resolution. Do, do you want to share that information? Yes, I'd, I'd love to. I brought it just in case. Uh, actually, we did um, a Senate joint resolution. I believe it was... Um, well, it was last week, and I'm trying to think of the exact day, but forgive me for that. It was like Wednesday, um, and I believe the House was supposed to do it on Thursday or something to that effect. But um, if I, if if people would like me to read the um, uh, Senate Joint Resolution, it's 24-003 concerning the designation of January 22nd as Roe v. Wade Anniversary Day. That's what I have. It's not a it's not um, the actual ballot uh, wording itself, but I don't know if that would help, um, if that's something that people would like to hear um, in light of um, you know our speakers joining on. Would, would that well, be Senator, a... you might wanna offer some of that information. We, yes. I believe uh, another individual will be joining us who can provide information from Cobalt Advocates Okay. But maybe you can offer some information in the meantime. Okay. Well, I will read the resolution because all of the um, all of uh, uh, the women, uh, Democratic women, uh, stood up at the well, and it uh, it it was read by one person. Uh, whereas on January twenty second, seven nineteen seventy three, the Supreme Court of the United States found in Roe v. Wade. Uh, that the United States Constitution protects the right to abortion, and whereas on June 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned the precedent established by Roe v. Wade in 1973 and Planned Parenthood of Southern of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. Um, the United States Constitution does not confer a right to abortion and that the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people of their elected representatives. And it's a little lengthy, so it's, um, uh, yeah, if they happen to hop on, let me know. Whereas Justice uh, Breyer, uh, Sotomayor, and Kagan issued a dissenting opinion in Dobbs stating that whatever the exact scope of the common laws, one result of today's decision is certain that the curtailment of women's rights and of their status as free and equal citizens, and whereas the surest protection against the curtailment of rights is now offered only by state legislatures and within the state constitutions, and whereas upon the Dobbs decision and again on the following anniversary of the 1973 Roe ruling, tens of thousands of Coloradans across the political spectrum took to the streets throughout the state to express their disappointment and rage. Whereas overturning Roe has resulted in significant physical and mental trauma to, as well as significant financial burden on people no longer able to access abortion care where they live and who they must seek care and, and who must seek care elsewhere. And whereas marginalized groups have been systematically denied equal access to abortion even before Roe was overturned, especially Black, Latin, and in Indigenous people of color, people with lower incomes, and people in remote, rural, or underserved areas. And um, hold on. I have a message from, and uh, I'm going to hold here. Um, I hear that uh, Karen Middleton. Um, Kathy has is going to jump on. Did you hear that? I think uh, Senator Janal, she's going to try to jump on. We're not. We don't have that confirmed at the moment. Okay. All right. Excuse me. Um, continuing on. Uh, whereas on April fourth, twenty twenty two, to secure the statutory right to abortion, free from government interference, in the face of pending Dobbs decision. Governor Polis signed into law House Bill 22-1279, passed by the Colorado General Assembly, titled the Reproductive Health Equity Act, or RIA. And whereas on April 14th, 2023, Governor Polis signed into law the package of three bills passed by the Colorado General Assembly titled Safe Access to Protected Health Care Package, or SAPHC 
which included Senate Bills 23188, 23189, and 23190. And whereas Senate Bill 23188 codified protections for Colorado's patients, providers, and helpers of abortion and gender affirming care against out of state prosecutions, civil lawsuits, and investigations and extradition claims, and whereas Senate Bill 23189 mandated that abortion be a covered service without deductibles, copays, or coinsurance under private health insurance plans, which protects Coloradans on private plans, but not the hundreds of thousands of Coloradans on publicly funded insurance plans. And whereas Senate Bill 23190 categorize the deliberate false advertising of abortion services as a deceptive trade practice. And whereas the right to abortion is still not currently an explicit constitutional right in Colorado and has therefore been challenged 49 times since 2010 in the state legislature. And whereas Colorado voters defeated fetal personhood amendments, which are total abortion bans by 30%, that was Amendment 67 in 2014, and by 41% Amendment 62 in 2010, and by 46% Amendment 48 in 2008. And whereas in 2020, Colorado voters defeated Proposition 115, a 22-week abortion ban by 18% with more votes cast opposing it than President Biden received on the same ballot. And whereas Amendment 3 of the Colorado Constitution adopted in 1984 by a margin of fewer than 10,000 votes forbids the use of public funds by state and local governments to cover abortion. And whereas, while Amendment 3 passed by less than 1% of the vote in 1984, in 1922, exit polling during Colorado's midterm elections found 63% of voters voter respondents agreed that Colorado's constitution should be amended to protect abortion. And whereas polling has consistently shown that a significant majority of Colorado voters support an amendment making abortion a constitutional right and repealing the prohibition on health insurance cover coverage for abortion. Um, whereas for the past four decades, as a direct result of Amendment 3, Colorado state and local government employees and Coloradans enrolled in state insurance programs have been denied insurance coverage for abortion for themselves and for their families, resulting in discriminatory and harmful effects on those impacted. And whereas Colorado was the first state in the nation to legalize abortion and Colorado has since led the nation at the ballot box and in the legislature and should continue to lead the nation in protecting abortion access without restriction. And whereas in 2024, Coloradans will be asked to vote on the general election ballot on a constitutional amendment protecting abortion, thus repealing the earlier discriminatory amendment three of the Colorado constitution from 1984. And now therefore be it resolved by the state Senate, the 74th general assembly of the state of Colorado the House of Representatives, that we, the members of the General Assembly, recommend for voters to amend the Colorado Constitution to enshrine it, the right to abortion, and prohibit Colorado state and local governments from denying or discriminating against the exercise of that right, and hereby designate January 22 as of each year as Roe v. Wade Anniversary Day. Thank you, Senator Chenal. That that was very helpful context and. We're fortunate now that Karen Middleton from Cobalt Advocates has joined us. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, just for background, I, I did uh, have an opportunity to look at Cobalt's website, and I just wanted to give some background, which I'm sure, Karen, you can expand upon. But Cobalt uh, Advocates uh, is dedicated to fighting for systems, structures, and policies that protect reproductive rights and guarantee comprehensive universal access to reproductive health care, including abortion. So Karen, I'm, I'm hoping that you can expand on uh, Senator Janal's information and give us more background on this ballot initiative. 
Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, it's been a busy week. So I don't know where um, my person was, but let me go ahead and um, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. And then I also want to let you know, I have our campaign director, Jess Grennan on. She is at the airport. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the I will share this. I'm driving up to Vail for a fundraiser this afternoon. So uh, between the dog walk and the shower, you're getting me. So I'm glad <laughs> you all caught me and that everyone has my phone number. So I'm going to take it from the top and say, um, and I will get to your question, but let me just start with um, this ballot measure is being run by the Colorado Reproductive Health Rights and Justice Coalition. So I'm both the president of COBALT and I am co-chair of the campaign. And I'm joined with partners from six other organizations. And <clears throat> one of the things to know about us is that we are, you know, a lot of times you will mount a ballot measure and it's just around a political season and you're kind of up and you're down. And uh, for many folks that works, we are a year round uh, grassroots set of organizations. So we've been working on this all through the last couple of years. We actually started talking about it in the middle of 21. Um, our co coalition's track record is quite strong. In 2020, the coalition defeated Prop uh, 115, which was a 22-week abortion ban, and that was across state and party lines, state and party lines. So that we la um, it lost by 18%. And what's really interesting is that we won in, meaning we defeated it in eight of the 10 most populous counties. Um, and we actually exceeded the number of votes that um, Republican candidates, uh, let's see, I'm trying to read this. We're, we, let me just say it in my own words and not look at the slide. Um, we got more votes than either the president or the U.S. senator. So we outperformed because we had bipartisan support. So across the state, you will find that not only do we have a strong uh, track record with Democrats who would be one of our natural partners, but unaffiliated voters and Republican voters continue to surprise us and uh, or surprise mainstream media, not us, and really stick with us. Prior to that, there were three other ballot measures. So it was really after understanding that we could talk to voters about abortion later in pregnancy. Um, and they really thought they had us, right? Running that in the middle of COVID, we were on, we ran that entire campaign by Zoom. I basically never left this uh, laptop for five months, but uh, we we talked to voters and voters were with us. Um, and that's something that's really important. And that's why we think that this ballot measure really has, has the ability to be so successful. Our goal is to remove, and I know it was stated in the reading of the um, resolution, but removing the 1984 insurance coverage ban, um, and it will allow um, insurance coverage for public servants. So I like to give the example when I was a state legislator and I had Kaiser, my insurance coverage as a state employee would not cover abortion. I have Kaiser now, <clears throat> so people on my staff, if they needed to access abortion, would be able to pay for it with the very same insurance. And we think this is an unfair barrier, and it's a government intrusion on your ability to use your insurance for your own health care. Um, we have about a million people that are um, prohibited from covering abortion care, and so we think that's a significant number of folks that are impacted. And the thing that um, we really lead with and that you will hear the um, quite a few people being very excited about is we're recognizing the right to abortion in, in the Constitution to prevent future attempts to restrict it. So um, you could have a... a change of political winds in the legislature and we could change who's in charge and the protections that we currently have and enjoy would go away. And that's why we, it's so important. And I, you know, I love seeing uh, Senator Jinnall and I have been in the trenches many a time because we've also seen um, 40 plus bills uh, attempting to restrict or control access to abortion, um, reporting, um, putting people in jail. I mean, it's just really um, overwhelming. And so this really would serve to ensure that protection over um, the long haul. And that's why we think it's so important. The text, <clears throat> did you read the text? Because I'm not going to reread it. Was the text of the ballot measure and what you yes. uh, reported, Senator Jinnall, so I'm not boring anybody? Yes. Okay. 
So I won't say it again, but here it is. We think it's very clean. It's very clear. And we try to use, you know, it's really hard when you're using legal speak in the community, but we really try to keep the language as simple and understandable because we know voters don't want to feel like someone is trying to fool them. Uh, just so you understand the impact of what's happening in other states, and I'm grateful to live in Colorado right now, is that we have seen uh, a 500% increase in patients from Texas. Texas in particular is such a large population state and geographically close from us that people are losing their health options. And I've heard so many stories. One that really particularly hits home is we have an OBGYN who formerly served on our board and leads a lot of the work for ACOG here in the state. She was dealing with a family that had to, where a woman had an ectopic pregnancy. And so if you have an ectopic pregnancy and your pregnancy is proceeding, you could experience a rupture, which can cause a catastrophic health condition for the mother. And the baby is not viable in an ectopic pregnancy. It can't survive. So they got in their car with their spouse and their kids and drove 19 hours. And the doctor knew that this was happening and they were coming. And it was so stressful on everybody involved because if you've ever driven from Colorado to Texas, imagine if you had a catastrophic health crisis on one of those long stretches where there's absolutely nothing but cornfields and cows, uh, depending on what part I think of Kansas. Um, so it's really been devastating to see that this is important medical health care. And if you're talking to your doctor about the range of options, understand that some of those states are not even letting you talk about what's going on. Um, and so we've really seen uh, Colorado medical professors professionals stepping up and being able to provide more care. I will also let you know that as the year has wrapped up, we run an abortion fund at Cobalt, separate from this campaign. We ended up spending $1.25 million on patients, and about half the patients are from Colorado. So we're still seeing that we're taking care of a lot of people who live in Colorado, and we're seeing an influx of people coming from outside of Colorado. But being that safe place that people can come and protect and care for everybody's here is why that right is so important to us. It is a winning issue. And so we know that there, and I said it right at the beginning, is that we see that voters across the state, and I've had more surprising conversations. Um, I've called into Kansas when they were uh, protecting their constitutional freedom. Um, but I've had calls all across the state and I've really spoken to people. And when you peel back, you know, that initial, um, you might think you disagree because you don't think you uh, are going to share the same values. This is a common value. And it may not be that everyone is talking about abortion explicitly, although we lean into it. We will also talk about the freedom to um, protect or access reproductive health care, um, the idea that government shouldn't be in your business, that really you should be able to make that decision for yourself with your family. There we go. I'm going to skip past this one because um, it's not that exciting. Um, I just want you to know it is exciting, my campaign manager would tell me, but I think for the purposes of this presentation, just to let you know that our plan is to submit 185,000 signatures before April 25th to qualify for the ballot. And here's the hot, uh, the interesting thing is April 25th, 1967 is when Republican Governor John Love decriminalized abortion in Colorado um, all those years ago. So I feel like there's some good um, good vibes here that this is our date to turn in and we are going to do it. Um, we need to collect at least 2% of the total registered electors in 35 state Senate districts and... Um, we're also doing research um, that includes both um, electoral polling, we are working with a Latino policy agenda, and we're also working up with a polling firm called Black Insights. So we're really looking at long-term community engagement and development in this. And this is some research, just a lot of times people will say, gosh, I think that Latino voters aren't going to be with you. Well, what we see is that uh, they do not agree with these bans across the country and that 62% supported they're more likely to make an abortion rights stronger by allowing state funded insurance program to cover costs. So um, we think that's a great um, note that people should be thinking about. Um, 
we've already launched. Sorry, I did this one for last week. So I talked about leading for our, with our values, um, demonstrating that the abortion is a thoughtful decision, talking about values, government control and overreach versus freedom and privacy. And really, um, I encourage anyone who's talking about this in the community to broaden that scope of the conversation to bring more people in. I think that's what I've got. And I see that Kiera has joined us too. So she might um, go for me and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and happy to open it up to questions and yeah. perhaps have my colleague Let's, take yeah. some of those questions for me. Great. Let me, first of all, thank you, Karen and Jess for being here. And I also want to welcome Kira Hatton Sen Senna, also from Cobalt Advocates. Um, yeah, let's open, let's open up to questions. We um, have a few that have already been written into the chat, but remember, if you want to ask your question live, you can raise your hand also. But I think most of the questions that have come in thus far are our attendees are interested in how do we sign the petition and where that will happen. Um, does somebody want to answer that just so people know if they want to support this, how they can get their hands on a how they can get their signature on a petition? So first of all, I think having someone local. So Rosemary Rader has put her email in the chat. And getting her to, um, if you're local, she can go ahead and do that. We also have a mobilize link, which I might ask one of my colleagues to post, and I could get it in a couple of minutes, that um, is a place where you can sign up if you want to be trained to gather petitions. I will say <coughs> one of the things this week is we've had launch events all over the state, and people have been raising their hand and we were totally overwhelmed by volunteers um, wanting to um, get those petition signed. So we absolutely have ways for you to do that and to get involved. Um, I will give you my, my um, email is Karen at cobaltadvocates.org. There you go. And I also, um, yes, uh, public insurance, Margaret Long, includes Medicaid coverage. Um, and one thing I didn't mention in this presentation, and I'm sorry, I was definitely tailoring it from a different group, but I wanted to uh, be responsive. And I got the dog walked, so we're good, um, is that uh, we have no, there's no fiscal impact of this ballot measure. So a lot of times when you read, I, you were, we were saying that we have simple language, and there's no fiscal impact. So yes, uh, st under strict scrutiny, um, there are state dollars that intermix. And I was having some conversations with a voter who really doesn't like the idea of, and you know, the biggest objection we're going to get is the idea or notion of taxpayer funded abortion. But one of the ways I've responded to that is one, there's no increase in spending by the state of Colorado. And two, most of you, I would suggest to pay for your health insurance through your have in health insurance through your employer, you are paying for a portion of that. So to restrict how your portion of dollars are being used is really a disservice. So in the total uh, spending around health care and reproductive health care, we do not see a fiscal impact, which we think is a really um, good way of threading the needle around what might be an objection. Great. Um, Representative Basenecker put a question in here. What are we hearing from healthcare providers in terms of the increased need for abortion care and reproductive health care services since the overturning of Roe versus Wade? So we are seeing, I mean, the system has been overwhelmed. And on the national landscape, the loss of reproductive health care for so many states has truly been a travesty. I will say that I, it's like, a group of heroes, the people who have stepped up to provide care in Colorado. So here's what I'm seeing. Uh, Kaiser Permanente is now providing abortion care in-house. They all, um, they were always referring to Planned Parenthood, but they were trained abortion providers in-house. So that's been a way to ease the pressure so that people can get care uh, from their own providers. Uh, Denver Health uh, in early November expanded abortion care and 
they are able to provide abortion care to their patients as well. We are also seeing a real increase in providers who have moved here from other states. There are a couple of, there's a doctor who testified for our package of bills in 23. She literally moved with her family in the middle of the night from Tennessee, and she's here practicing and providing care in Colorado. We are seeing, I, I know of a number, we run a medical advisory committee, which is a loose network of everyone who provides abortion across the state. We're seeing more people who weren't providing abortions, but were trained, who've come back in and said, how can I help? We've seen a rise in telehealth and telemedicine uh, for those folks uh, for whom uh, medication abortion is an option. Um, and we've really seen uh, providers, while being overwhelmed, stepping up. I do know that there's been a back... At, I think it's smoothed out, but initially there was a real backlog in getting your regular reproductive health care. You want to get an IUD inserted. You want a regular annual exam that the calendar was filling up. We, I think that our providers have been, because many of them are full spectrum practices, right? They're delivering babies. They're putting in uh, forms of birth control. They're doing regular appointments and they're providing abortion care. And so they've been able to ramp up and assist, which has been um, truly helpful in these times. Thank you. Um, Pat Screnty Lamb is asking if the amendment goes into the constitution, do we still have a problem if the US Supreme Court outlaws abortion in the future? I think that it's the Supreme Court already did the damage by returning the decision to the states. I think that there is a threat of a national ban, but I think it's only a threat. I think that the voters have spoken. And if you look at the 2022 elections, you look at Kentucky, you look at Ohio, you look at Kansas uh, and more to come. Uh, Michigan was a big one, um, that voters across the country are really not having this. And actually, I think us successfully putting this into the Constitution and expanding care and protecting care, me meaning more people have the choice in their own insurance and it's protected by the Constitution, we become a national model for other states. I spoke to someone from Missouri last week that's about to run a ballot measure. We really can be a national model for how we uh, stand back, stand up against this. And I don't think a national ban would um, truly be complicated, contemplated in Congress and the Senate because of um, the impact that they're going to see this year and the impact that they saw in 22. So I believe it is a threat, but I'm, I'm not going to, I think that the more we do on the ground now, the less likely that will be. And frankly, if we can get the control of the U.S. House this year, I would say a protective, there are protective bills. Yadira Caraveo just introduced something. There have been another number of measures at the national level to protect abortion in, at the congressional level, and they should have done it. Uh, they should have done it when I started this job. When we had the Supreme Court, we had the presidency, and we had democratic control, and we didn't do it then, and we didn't think we would need to. So lesson learned. So I would say it's going to be really important. And Diana DeGette co-chairs the Pro-Choice Caucus in Congress, and she has said the number of members is the highest in history, and the support is the highest in history. So I'm 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 feeling more confident that we're going to push back some of that um, nonsense as we move forward. Thank you, Karen. Just want to uh, call everybody's attention to the chat. There's a lot of information in the, that's being posted in there about how you can get your hands on a petition, more information about this ballot initiative. Um, so please take a look at that and copy those down if you're interested. Senator Janal, I see that you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, for um, hopping on. I so appreciate it. Um, a couple of questions uh, that I'll just uh, go right to them. Um, first of all, how many signatures again do we have to have and by what date? And um, if, when, and I like to say if, when this uh, ballot initiative uh, passes, um, uh, when does that go into effect? Um, immediately or do we wait till 2025, the first of 2025? Um, 
the first question, the legal requirement is about 125,000 signatures. The campaign is going to target more like 185,000 to make sure that we don't miss. And the important piece is that each Senate district has to have a minimum number of signatures gathered. I believe it's January 1st when it goes into effect. And one of my team members can correct me. And Jess it has is, been, Karen. Say it again. It is. Yeah. Okay, so, everyone. Jess, do you want to talk? Because uh, you're heading onto a plane. So if you want to just add in your two cents, I'll hush. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you. I'm at BIA, BIA this morning heading back to Montana. But it's wonderful to see so many folks that have been supportive of the work that we've done in the past. Senator Janelle, so good to see you. Again, um, we got to work on end of life options together back in 2016. Um, and we won that campaign with 65% of the vote. So I'm hoping abortion can beat that. Um, but we're really excited with all the work that's been happening here in Colorado. We are collecting 185,000 signatures. I can tell you with our paid program, we're a little ahead of schedule, which I am so excited about. Um, and just couldn't be more thrilled about the response people are hearing. We have trained over 500 people to collect signatures already, which is huge. Um, we really wanted to spend the time to make sure that we're doing it right. That way, all of those signatures are good. We have had several fundraisers this week in um, Colorado itself. Last week alone, we raised over $200,000 in Colorado um, from donors. So we're just really excited where we're at. Our launch in Denver, um, we had you know, close to 200 people there is what I'm hearing now from the sign-up sheets, which I couldn't be more thrilled about. Karen, that's a new number, by the way, for you. Um, but we're really excited about where we're at. We just, you know, we had events in Durango, Grand Junction, Fort Collins that have just been hitting the, hitting it out of the park of turnout because people are hungry for this. Colorado is a leader on reproductive rights and justice and reproductive health. I'm talking to campaigns, as Karen mentioned, across the country. The New York campaign had us on the call to talk about what we're doing the other day. So I'm feeling really positive. We have many of your colleagues who have endorsed the ballot measure. And if I was at my computer right now, I could give you the list. Um, Senator Janelle, I'll send you the um, address of the Fort Collins office, uh, Fieldworks office in the hours. Thank you. Yes, in fact, we, we did a fundraiser up in Fort Collins on the 17th with Betsy Markey, and a number of you were there, and we uh, ran into a paid gatherer on the way to the event who was uh, uh, just off of College um, Avenue, so it was very, College in Maine, I believe, so um, that was very exciting, and Kiera is based in Rye, which is about 45 minutes south of Pueblo and um, she had a complete tech meltdown. So she was trying to get to a library to get Wi-Fi. So for our elected officials, that last mile is always still a nightmare for all of us. So she apologizes. I don't even know if she can hear us. I see that she's on, but I got, I just got a text. So um, that was why you didn't have us, but I, it was fine. We're, um, we all support each other and back each other up. So not a problem. We're an adjustable yeah. team. <laughs> yes. you, you know, other, getting, oh, you've sorry, that today you yeah did, yeah and, you you all just came right on and I I also want to tip my hat to uh Rosemary for coming on too and sharing information as we began um Senator Janal did you have another question no did I not put my hand no I, I was just wanting to check back with you um there is a question in the chat about medically induced abortion and whether it will be protected, uh, protected by the ballot initiative. Yes, you can have medication or procedural abortion um, and you get to decide that. And we really try to make sure that people have the option to the choice that works for them. There is a big effort to put more medication abortion um, make it more available in banned states. And so we are supporting telehealth providers that are mailing uh, abortion pills into banned states. And we are proudly doing that. And we are proudly being funded to do that. So um, that would continue to be protected with this ballot measure. The problem is that um, that awful justice down in Texas, who's trying to roll back mifepristone as um, a legal 
uh, way to have an abortion. And mifepristone and misoprostol are the two pills that you use a combination, mif mifi that you say, and then miso. So it's alphabetical, so I always remember which order. And you get the first two, and then you get the second. Um, and the issue is they're trying to deregulate one because it's the best practice and it's the gold standard that you do both. You can actually use just misoprostol if we ever have to get to that point. But Danko, which is the pharmaceutical company that's behind Mifepristone, has really been lovely in terms of fighting this loud, proud, and hard. We just signed on to an amicus brief um, protecting Mifepristone. So there's a separate regulatory fight around Mifepristone, um, but medication abortion being able to access. And so basically the first pill stops the pregnancy. The second pill causes the pregnancy to it basically causes cramping and it would expel the pregnancy. It is very effective. People can then take their time and be home. It feels a little bit like experience a mi experiencing a miscarriage. And one of the problems is if you're flying from Texas, you might want a procedural abortion so you're in and done and you're not experiencing what would be like a miscarriage over a few days. And that might be TMI for some of you, but just understanding that this is about what the person needs for themselves. And we really feel very strongly that we're going to help you with whatever care you need, however you need it, and we're going to fight to protect it in Colorado. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, uh, Representative Basenecker, your hand is up. Uh, thanks, Beth. And uh, thank you, uh, Karen and Kira. I'm so sorry to hear about your stressful morning. And Jess, thanks for being on. I'm just wondering um, if, if you all could talk a little bit about some of the economic justice um, angles of being able to ensure access to reproductive health care and abortion care when needed. I'm just struck by the equity piece in this in terms of how folks in our state, I think, will really be in a much better position as opposed to states that are taking, unfortunately, what I understand to be very damaging and dangerous actions. Thank you so much for raising that question. You know, I th I just go back to kind of nuts and bolts. If you think about your own family, your own household, the, the decision about adding a child to your household is economic from start to finish, from cost of daycare to do you have a car that's big enough for one more car seat to can you afford to be away from your job? Do you get benefits? Um, everything around the economics of um, having a child gets brushed under the rug a little bit. And, and honestly, it is the biggest factor. And we know that, um, you know, lots of people make that decision one way or the other. And economics has to be a part of that conversation, right? Some people will say, you know what, my economics are tight, but we're going to figure out how to make this work and more power to them. But for others who might already have two kids at home or however many that they've decided they cannot add a child and six out of 10 people who access abortion already have children. So they know what they're doing. This is not, you know, there's this narrative that somehow it's this mythical, you know, nobody, um, ever thinks about that. So that's something that's really important. There's also a really um, excellent study called the Turnaway Study. And the acronym is ANSIRH, and I don't have the link offhand, but if you type in ANSIRH, the Turnaway Study, it is a long longitudinal study, the longest of its kind, that really shows the impact of whether someone was able to access an abortion when they wanted it and what happened after and they follow them over time and what they found is people who were able to access an abortion when they needed it um, may have sex, su successfully gone on to have a child or to do something else that they wanted when they were ready and that the economics were much better and if they had it uh, they had to have the baby because they had no choices. There were things like economic impact. They might have been in an unsafe relationship or victim of domestic violence at the time. Uh, they may not have been able to um, complete a job or there was something else. And it really shows that these are big decisions and important decisions and fundamentally economic decisions. And we are really proud. This is one of the only ballot measures being run right now that has such a strong economic justice framework. The idea that where you work uh, determines uh, whether you get some kind of insurance. And I I've talked about this just casually, but the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case 
if you think about it, Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case said, if you work for Hobby Lobby, we don't have to pay for your birth control. This is a little, if you think about it, it's government saying the employer gets to decide. And what we're saying is the government's going to protect you from your employer. And in this case, the employer is the state. So the people are going to protect you from the state being able to block this. So that's a little bit of my, I've been noodling about that. You can help me do a better job of talking about that. But I think it's really important. And I do think it's ultimately economic because what if you have to make a decision about where you're working based on what kind of health care you're getting? So thanks for the question. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we do have time for a couple more questions. Is there anything coming through the chat or does somebody want to raise their hand? Okay, then. Well, this has been a very informative discussion this morning. I want to thank Karen and Jess and Kiera from the Cobalt Advocates for joining us this morning and uh, again, showing us what a team you are. You have each other's <laughs> backs. And I also want to thank our hosts, our local le legislators. And I also want to remind everybody that there will be um, a local legislators town hall in two weeks on Saturday, February 10th from 10 to 1130 a.m. at the PSD Future Ready Center, which is located at Foothills Mall, a great new meeting space. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. We appreciate your uh, participation and interest and I hope everybody has a wonderful Saturday. Thank you very much. Thanks all, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody, thank you.